Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. Sometimes being honest with people just makes no sense. I say that because we had listed our home on the Oregon coast for sale three months earlier, and we had not received one offer. We are located south of Brookings, and although Highway 101 lay between us and the ocean, we owned 37 acres of mostly pine trees, except for our small garden and a miniature orchard with a few fruit trees. We had lived on that place for over 40 years, and the few houses nearby had changed hands a few times, but usually by retirees, and they had sold rather quickly. So when we decided to move into a senior care center due to mobility problems, we thought selling our property would be an easy matter, so we called a friend of our son's who works for the local real estate agency. We'll call him Tom. Well, Tom was already familiar with our home as he had sold homes all around us over the years, and his own father had been friends with our builder, so it was easy. Maybe I should say too easy, as after eight long months, we still had not had a single offer. People would come along with Tom or another realtor, and they all, for the most part, seemed to love the property. But that would be the end of it. There wasn't one offer. Knowing that we were reaching our limit of patience, Tom came over one day to have a sit-down with us because we had already lowered our asking price on two different occasions, but to no avail. Tom had never brought it up before, but as we went over the entire procedure, all the way to the point where Tom would politely excuse himself to give the buyers time to visit with us privately, he was shaking his head, trying to find something that kept killing the sales. And although he said that he inquired of each buyer as to why they didn't want the house, they never gave any good reason. And he had sold each one of them a different home. Tom was preparing to leave when he turned back around and asked if maybe something in our private sit-down with the buyers was causing them to leave without so much as an offer. So we agreed the role play with him. We went over the typical conversation and he was still shaking his head when I got to the part about the Sasquatch and his eyes got wide as he asked us exactly what we were saying to people. I just told him that we would tell the people that if they bought our home, we hoped that they would continue to care for the family of Sasquatch that lived way back in the forest. We would tell them the food items that we occasionally bought from the store and that the fruit trees out back had been planted after we had first moved in and how the Sasquatch family had enjoyed them. Then we would assure the people that the animals were friendly and they only came out in the nicer weather when there was not much rain. Then they would all seem to leave happy. 
Tom suddenly startled us when he threw back his head and raised his arms high above him and said, that's it. Tom seemed almost beside himself as he kept shaking his head, and I know he was blaming us for the fact the house hadn't sold, even though he didn't say so. We had a long discussion about future customers, and we finally but reluctantly agreed that we would not discuss the Sasquatch, although we felt it was our personal obligation to protect the poor creatures that had been like our pet all of these years. We needed to desperately sell. About a week later, we finally had a couple show up with Tom, and after he gave them the tour and answered all of their questions, he stepped out to allow us a private visit at normal, only this time it was different. After we told the folks how much we had enjoyed living there, they gave us their background. They had lived their entire lives in the Los Angeles suburb and had studied for the last three years to select a place to retire, and they decided the Oregon coast would be the place for them. Then the lady made a statement I will never forget. Our dream home, although it'll never come true, would be to live near where your famous Bigfoot lived, so we could actually see one. My husband threw up his arms and laughed so hard he began to choke, and as I got up to go to his aid, he waved me off, and there he was laughing and slapping his leg while the people just stared. Then when he regained his composure, he apologized profusely and pointed to the door, saying for me to call Tom in, which I did. The buyers were sitting there looking confused when Tom came in and took a chair facing all of us. And I said, now Tom, we want you to tell these nice people about the secret that you made us agree to no longer mention about our neighbors. The look on Tom's face was as funny as it was seriously doubting what he had heard me say. He timidly asked if I meant Sasquatch, to which we all laughed. After that, we went in detail of our encounters with them as many as we could remember. Anyway, the sale happened quickly, and in thinking back, perhaps I should have early on found a better way to test whether or not something like Sasquatch living on the property might be alarming. It has been six months since we sold, and yesterday we met with our buyers in the store, and when they saw us, they rushed over to tell us about their first meeting with our Sasquatch, and incidentally, they were buying a large number of pears, apple, and squash for their new neighbors. They were so incredibly happy, and so are we, as our friends will continue to live with protection. On to the next one. I was employed as a physical therapist intern for Native people in Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. I had the pleasure of meeting a lady who would help me understand the traditional belief systems of the Stoney, the Asani Bone in the West Central Alberta people. Although the Stoney share much in common with the Supsan group, they are in many ways Algonquin and Cree words like Napo people are very common. While my friend acknowledged the neighboring Cree belief in Windigo, she said that in Stoney the name was Misnapo meaning simply big people. She added that when she was a child of about 10, in around 1944, she accompanied her aunt, uncle, and cousin in a horse-drawn wagon west of Rocky Mountain House on a dirt road, now the David Thompson Highway between Red Deer and the Columbia Icefield. On a sunny summer day, they were rounding a corner in the road on the north shore of Abraham Lake near Windy Point, when they abruptly stopped, causing all the children in the back to stand up. She said that they all saw, standing in the road, a hundred yards in front of them, a large, seven- or eight-foot-tall man-like creature covered with black hair. At that instant, her uncle quietly exclaimed, Musnapo, and her aunt told all the children to lie down in the back of the wagon while the aunt threw a blanket over them. She said that her uncle just turned the wagon around on the road and headed them back to home. I did not doubt her sincerity. She added that numerous people of her tribal First Nation had seen the Misnapo around the Saskatchewan River while summer berry picking. 
I had studied anthropology as a major in my undergrad years at Winnipeg, Manitoba, and had assembled as my major graduating paper a comprehensive paper on Sasquatch-like beings in Western Canada. This is now lost much to my regret. My ethnography professor at the time, who had worked with the Chippewan, was so pleased with my effort that he encouraged me to continue the work as a master's thesis, but I am afraid that a concurrent acceptance into physical therapy has put all that on hold for at least 25 years. A professor wrote me in the 70s sharing coastal material, and I have since gathered a few other bits. Working in Nanaimo, B.C. in 1974-79, to 79, Mr. Confidential told me that in Nanaimo dialect of Hakomilan, there were three types of creatures similar to Sasquatch. In fact, he said the first two were identical to the mainland creature, were hairy and black, a bit larger than a man, called Squinus and Papius. Even a white man could see these creatures, and they have no special powers. However, he added, you could get one as a guardian spirit, and it would make you really strong. But they would also make you a little bit, well, unlucky, he continued. I knew a fellow once who had one as a guardian spirit, and it made him really strong. He could handle the pive poles and the log booms with just one hand but nothing ever seemed to go quite right for him. That was the only problem with having one as a guardian spirit. The other creature was the Kiwai Akotl, a tree striker. They were a lot like the other two, but would knock down trees and make a big sound. If you ever tried to follow their tracks, they would lead you around in a big circle and make you go crazy. He added, he and his dad had been fishing at Dodd Narrow in the 40s, and they had heard a tree fall just on shore in the forest, and he asked his dad, what was that? And his father replied, that was a Kauai Atatl. Don't even think of going there. But late that night, I did sneak off the boat in the skiff and rowed to shore. I tried to find the tree, but couldn't, and came back. In the morning, my dad just looked at me and said, you went, didn't you? And was a little mad at me, but nothing ever happened. And we didn't mention it again. Right now, I'm collecting Tinglet, Kustika, Haida, Goget, and other local narrative from the Ketchikan area. These are both Sasquatch-like creatures, but, as I'm sure you well know, include references in half the cases to giant, half-man, half-otter characteristics. In Saxman, near Ketchikan, however, the creature is more like a Sasquatch. Of some local tinglet will use the word Hutzlan, which they use to refer to anything like a Bigfoot. In order to distinguish between land otter people or Kushteka, Gogit, who may or may not have tails on one hand, and Sasquatch-like creatures on the other, some Haida and Prince of Wales in Heidelberg use the name Herringman for Sasquatch fear of ridicule by other natives and non-natives and a fear of spiritual or metaphysical consequences inhibit much open discussion of Kushteka or Gagit. The same may be said in the Tsamishan village of Melakata on Annette Island of Baush. Although the creature is not transformational and resembles the Belakula Bukwas. On to the next one. In Marshall County in Oklahoma, I was down on the lake target practicing with my rifle. My mother had come along to get out of the house. I was shooting into a mud bank at the edge of a small clearing that has a deep gully running down beside it. I had been there about a week before and had left early because I had been overcome with a sudden dread bordering on terror. I had been unable to explain this at the time but the events that transpired next seemed to have justified my fear. I had fired several shots to set in my scope while my mother walked down to the lake. I soon had my scope set and followed my mother down to the lake, taking my rifle with me. We then decided to walk up to an area where I wanted to check for deer sign, which is directly across the gully from the car. At this time, the sun was just going down on the horizon. 
We had just reached the area, and I was busy looking at the ground for sign when I heard a series of peculiar whistles. At first, I thought it might have been a cow, but they were too high-pitched and had a strange quality to them. As I was listening to this, my mother walked over and told me that someone was standing by the car. I couldn't see the car from the trees where I was at, so I walked over to where she had been standing. I could see the car, but couldn't see anyone. Then I asked her if she still could see them, thinking she might have mistaken a tree for something else. She told me it was gone. As I said earlier, the sun was going down, and it was getting dark, so we started back down the hill, around where the gully terminated, and up the dirt road that ran past the clearing where the car was parked. By the time we reached the road, it was getting dark enough to be hard to see. There was a lot of brush on the side of the road, and we couldn't see very far. As we were going up the hill about 20 yards from the car, the only way I can think to describe what happened next is to say we hit a wall of smell. It smelled just like an outhouse and was very powerful. About that point, I took what my mother had described to me to heart and decided that there was something in the bush in front of us and at that same time began to get extremely scared. I still had my rifle, so I fired a couple of shots into the air. No sooner had the echo died away, I heard heavy footsteps, like the sound of a man running away from us toward the car and the gully. These sounds ended with a heavy thud, like something jumping off the edge of the gully, and landed on the steep bank. We then cautiously made our way to the car. I held my rifle at the ready while my mom got in the car. While this was happening, I heard a sound coming from the edge of the gully about 15 yards in front of me. It sounded like a cross between rhythmic grating sounds and a human voice. I then got in the car and we drove away. After we drove home, my mother described to what she saw in more detail. What she saw was as follow. A tall, man-like shape with light from the setting sun behind it. She was unable to make out a face because the light behind it, but she could tell it was very broad-shouldered, and from the light surrounding it, it was covered in hair about six inches long and reddish-brown in color. Also, by using my own height as a scale, which is 5 at 11, and the car as a reference, we were able to determine that it was approximately seven feet tall. After considering all these things, we decided we had encountered at least one Sasquatch. As mentioned earlier, a week prior to this incident, I was overcome by fear, as if I was in danger. It might also be equated to a feeling of being watched. Also, in this same area, I have driven back at night and noted the smell again as whatever was down there is hanging around, or at least coming back. I have since this incident studied the Sasquatch phenomenon, and some things I have in the past noted in this area have taken on a new light, such as two trees I have found twisted off six foot up the trunk while out hunting. There were also sounds as if something were being thrown through the trees. On to the next one. In western Muskogee County in Oklahoma, the area was about four and a half miles south of the junction of Highway 16 and 72 west of Muskogee and two miles west of Highway 72. The creature, or whatever it was, was observed near a bridge above Cane Creek. I and one other person were in the area measuring and sampling rocks exposed near Cane Creek. We are geologists. Throughout that morning, farmers had been hunting on their lands. As a result, we could hear sporadic gunfire all around us. After about 30 minutes to an hour, most of the gunfire had ceased. Sometime later, as I worked, I heard a rustling sound behind me. Believing it to be some kind of animal coming toward us, I turned my head to see behind me. Immediately, I observed something hanging from a low branch over the bridge on the opposite bank of the creek from me. The first feature I noticed was the unusually long arms of the thing. Secondly, I noticed that it was covered by reddish-brown long hair. 
the creature was hanging from the lower branch with its arms much like an orangutan does. In fact, the hair and the way it was hanging from the tree made me think of it as an orangutan. Also, for some reason, I seemed to remember that the arms had less hair than the rest of the body. The entity that I saw was about four to five feet long, with about half of that being arm. The body was round and squat. I did not notice the legs or the head of the thing. The window of observation was about 10 to 15 seconds, although I cannot be positive. Anyway, as soon as I noticed the thing, it dropped from the trees onto the ground. However, the presence of the bridge prevented me from seeing it hit the ground, but I do believe I heard further rustling sounds, although that was probably just imagination. Afterwards, I asked my companion if he saw or heard anything. Although he indicated that he may have heard something, he said he did not see anything extraordinary. That meant I was the only witness. We did not really search the area afterward for traces of the creature itself, since no other unusual sounds or sights occurred after this. We felt that nothing would probably be revealed. However, I did have a vague, temporary feeling that this thing was advancing towards us. Of course, considering the brief span of observation time, the distance about 200 to 300 feet from me, and the lack of additional evidence, I still cannot be positive that what I saw was genuine. Nothing unusual was heard before or after the incident. I have been to this particular area many times. During subsequent visits, I have neither heard nor seen anything unusual. No physical traces of the creature has ever been found. The person who was with me did not see the creature. We were both busy collecting samples of black shale. The creature was observed hanging over a bridge spanning Cane Creek. The creature was on the opposite side of the creek from me, about 200 to 300 feet away. The area was heavily forested with the branches of the trees hanging over the bridge and the road. The road is a small sectional dirt road. We were working on an exposed section of black shale and coal. The south bank of Cane Creek was very steep, being composed of these lithologies. The north bank, where the creature was, was far more gentle. Both banks were heavily forested. Cane Creek was at a low level. The general landscape was gently rolling forested hills with large, flat trees, treeless pastures. The latitude was about 35 degrees, 41 minutes northwest. The longitude was about 95 degrees and 40 minutes west. On to the next one. All primates have five toes, wrote Barton Nully in his book, The Inhumanoid, Real Encounters with Beings That Can Exist. There are no exceptions, yet many of the footprints left by these creatures clearly show three, four, five, or even six or more toes on each print. Nully is correct. While South American spider monkeys, woolly spider monkeys, and African colobus monkeys present missing or atrophied thumbs, all primates have five toes. Generally speaking, the number of a mammal's toes is inversely related to how fast it can run. Think of a hooved animal, toed undulate, canids, and finally man on a rough spectrum of fastest to slowest. Most Sasquatch footprints presenting three toes does not appear as though the digits have been lost due to trauma. Generally speaking, these tracks depict three equally sized toes, or a larger, longer center toe flanked by two smaller ones. The heels, though, rarely remarked upon, either taper to a point or appear much narrower than a normal five-toed print. Setting hoaxers aside, what could naturally account for three-toed or tridactyl tracks? Flesh and blood hypothesis advocate commonly cite syndactyl, a birth defect where multiple digits are fused. While common in certain mammals, it is considered rare in humans. Current estimates place incidents at 1 in 2,000 to 3,000 births. To be fair, 
it is certainly possible that Bigfoot may present this defect more commonly. The Simiang, an arboreal gibbon native to Southeast Asia, derives its scientific name from the webbing between the third and fourth digits of its hand and feet. Even so, syndactyl is not a common feature or deformity in great apes. Beyond possible syndactyl, tridactyl footprints are odd for other reasons. Their overall aspect is peculiar. With few exceptions, they do not have the appearance one associates with a typical Bigfoot print. In these cases, the elongated heel and foot shape appear oddly avian. In a word, the entire affair looks silly, almost as though faked or formed as an afterthought. As one Dr. Roth of the Baltimore Zoo astutely joked to Barry and Slate, perhaps if Sasquatch are constructing and deconstructing and reconstructing themselves, they forgot to put on the rest of the toes. It is a widespread misconception that tracks with odd number toes are confined to a single region. This is simply untrue. The idea confirms flesh and blood hypothesis advocates because it preserves the notion Bigfoot are undiscovered primates, since an estimated 10 to 40 percent of human syndactyl cases are inherited. It stands to reason if syndactyl causes tridactyl tract the condition would occur within an isolated population in a specific region, perhaps due to inbreeding. Outliers are not confined to one single area, however. Here in North America, three-toed tracks have been found in Pennsylvania, Oregon, Mississippi, and Florida, wrote Tom Powell in The Locals. Tridactyl footprints are even attributed to Australian Yowies, Barry and Slate, handily addressed this fallacy as early as 1976. Stan Gordon, on his assessment of the Uniontown incident and others of the continuing Pennsylvania USO creature flap, argued that Bigfoot of the West Coast tradition and the Pennsylvania variety could not be one and the same, chiefly, it seems, because the former usually has five toes and the latter only three toes, they wrote, yet three-toed and four-toed creatures have been reported out west, in fact, and the descriptions otherwise are usually much the same. A family near Albuquerque, New Mexico had several encounters with a blank-faced man-sized figure roaming their backyard. In October of 1966, it cried like a baby and, in one instant, incapacitated a young witness. Peculiar prints shaped like a fork were found nearby. Beginning in May 1972, a tall, hairy creature began prowling Coal Hollow Road near Pretoria, Illinois, earning it the nickname the Coal Hollow Road Monster, or Como. The nine to ten foot tall, whitish haired beast was responsible for more than 200 phone calls to the police department. Como's very unusual tracks showed it had only three toes on each foot. Numerous sightings from 1973 to 1974 Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot flap featured prints with three toes. So many it birthed the erroneous assumption that only Pennsylvania Bigfoot are tridactyl. Three-fingered Sasquatch were also spotted during this time, and a Monongalea witness saw from her second-story window a large, hairy arm with three claws dangling from the roof, and a print left on the side of McChesney Town resident outlined a similar hand. Louisiana's famed Honey Island Swamp Monster docks the bayou, famously leaving behind pointed three-toed footprints. Though descriptions vary, it is regularly described as a large hairy hominid. Witnesses in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania mobile home spotted a Bigfoot peeking through their windows in July of 1975. Claw marks were later found on the screen door and tridactyl footprints were discovered in a nearby tunnel. In 1976, 
indigenous people living near Poplar River, Manitoba, regularly observed a large hairy creature around eight feet tall peeking in their doors and windows. The being was covered in gray-white fur and left behind three-toed tracks. North Carolina's Chatham County boasted numerous sightings along the Cape Fear River in 1976. The Bigfoot was approximately seven feet tall and ran with a slumping gait and would frequently scream. Tridactyl tracks, each measuring 18 inches, were found in the area. A trio of children discovered large three-toed footprints while playing in Somerset Hills, New Jersey, in 1976, they also heard loud knocks and caught a glimpse of a Bigfoot. Local newspaper claimed a flap of hairy and scary giants were terrorizing Rockaway and Chatham Township in neighboring Morris County Beef. In neighboring Morris County, beasts said to be nine feet tall supposedly left 18-inch footprints, always with only three toes. The Northern Ohio UFO Bigfoot sightings of 1981 are not often discussed, but featured a number of notable peculiarities. Witnesses on a rural farm in Rome, Ohio, not only saw nine-foot-tall, bulletproof Bigfoot, but experienced close encounters with a variety of light phenomena, including glowing objects in the sky. They also spotted dark, shadow people on this property, had automobiles mysteriously shut down, discovered 1,200 pounds, test parachute cords snapped to steal bait from traps, fired at something either shape-shifting into or projecting a similar crumb of the family horse, and documented footprints displaying three and five toes. In his self-published book, Night Siege, Dennis Filchus, who witnessed much of the activity, described tridactyl prints on the farm the morning after a June 25, 1981 encounter. Sure enough, we started finding a trail of prints left by the creature. They were large, circular footprints with three toe-like extensions. They were seven inches wide by eight inches long. From the way these prints were in the ground, the middle toe appeared to sink in deeper than the two sides. There were at least 40 or so of these impressions, starting from the side of the house and across the plow field up to the oil and gas wells west of the property. The trail was unusual in that there would be a few places where no prints appeared at all, then continue on to the other side of this void. There was a six-foot stride between prints, and it all appeared, whoever or whatever made them, that this was walking on two legs. Even more puzzling than the tridactyl prints was a curious whirl pattern Filchus noticed around another set of tracks. The 18-inch footprints found early in July 6th seemed to retain the morning dew for a full 12 hours, and Filchus observed that the field grass was swirling around the footprint impressions in a clockwise direction. It was one of the strange things I've ever seen. Nothing else in the field neither tractor mark nor tridactyl print and big hoof marks of some sort found in the vicinity display this effect. Though speculative, one's mind inevitably turns to crop circles which display a similar whirl writ language around their design. Even more peculiar than three-toed tracks are the two-toed bidactyl tracks recorded in a handful of other cases. Floor James Al Rennie stumbled across a set of large, bear-like two-toed tracks spaced equally in a single line, traversing a frozen lake in northern Canada. Though no hairy creatures were observed, Rennie believed they belonged to Windigo, a Native American entity sometimes synonymous with Bigfoot. This belief was dispelled or confirmed when Rennie saw the tracks materializing in front of him. Recall also the Traverse Spine Gorilla, which also left hoof-like, cloven tracks. In some ways, bidactyl tracks are easier to dismiss than tridactyl tracks as they are easily rationalized in the misidentified undulate footprint. 
For those arguing tracts with anomalous numbers of toads are generally confined to eastern half of the country, some of the most infamous Bigfoot cases in history featured three-toed tracks, as well, all west of the Mississippi River, footprints collected in the wake of the Falk Monster Flap, beloved in the Bigfoot community, are immortalized in the 1972 cult film The Legend of Boggy Creek, presented three toes. Primary witness Smokey Crabtree wrote of several hundred tracks he found. There were only three toes, and there wasn't all that much difference between the size of the first toe and the third toe. There was no place for other toes. It was not like his little toe had been burned off on a fire or frozen off. His foot was designed for three toes only. Other tridactyl footprints found west of the Mississippi, if only barely, include those from the Missouri Monster or Momo sightings. Beginning in 1972, a hairy, bipedal creature appeared in the small community of Louisiana, nestled along the banks of the river. Momo killed animals, and one instant it was seen with a dead dog under its arms. Three days later, Louisiana residents leaving church spotted two fireballs soaring from over Marzoff Hill and descending into the trees behind an abandoned school. One was green, the other white. This is just an example out of a plethora of unexplained aerial phenomenon, including a perfect gold cross on the moon during the Momo Flap. Tracks discovered on the farms of Freddie Robbins and Bill Suddarth in the late summer, all depicted three toes, including a set of prints 20 to 25 feet away from anything else. They began abruptly in the center of the garden and ended just as mysteriously, wrote author Troy Taylor. It looked as if the three-toed creature had just appeared in the center of the garden and then vanished. No tracks were found anywhere else on the property, and there was no sign any prankster could have made them either. Despite the popularity of stories like the Momo Flap, some in the Bigfoot community still dismiss their accompanying physical evidence embracing witnesses' testimony while condemning the tracks as fake. This is not the only intellectually dishonest, but illogical. Why would a hoaxer create footprints with three toes? If you were going to create a hoax and you wanted to fool your local authorities for even a day or two, would you not put five toes in your fake print? Cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman asked in Mothman and Other Curious Encounters. After all, most so-called Bigfoot tracks do show five toes. Why would a hoaxer leave such an obviously strange series of prints behind? It defies logic. Coleman is correct, and instead of suspecting three-toed tracks might be present in Bigfoot subspecies, or an entirely different type of large, hairy animal. Email lists and websites appear to be reinforcing the notion that everything huge and hominid, literally around the globe, is only some form of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Sadly, Bigfoot is the first frame of reference for news reporters, police officers, zookeepers, and college professors, often the first responders who are called upon when anything big and unknown is seen or an unusual footprint found. To suggest that perhaps a different kind of animal, one with three toes, exists in some of America's swamps is just asking too much for some of these folks. Coleman's speculation is informed by first-hand experience. While the Bigfoot UFO flap rocked Pennsylvania in 1973, Coleman was investigating sightings in Albany, Kentucky. Two large monkeys, for they had long bushy tails, a feature exceedingly rare in Bigfoot reports and a juvenile were seen on numerous occasions. The creature, which alternated between two legs and all fours, could rear up to six feet in height, and had a flat face, a cross between a human and an ape. One witness told Coleman how the animal wiped out two herds of pigs and lived in an abandoned mine nearby. The creatures left tridactyl footprints, although, in at least one case, nine toes were recorded. Green and Dehinden had investigated sightings of similar creatures four years prior in British Columbia when three-toed tracks were discovered. If there were just five-toed tracks and three-toed tracks each, and each type was of consistent shape, 
I would accept that as a clear indication of two different species, Green says, since there are four-toed tracks as well, and three-toed kind are very inconsistent in shape, I don't think such a conclusion would help very much. Separating five-toed Sasquatch from tall, hairy hominids with fewer toes is a stance championed by author Jerome Clark, who pioneered the concept of hairy bipeds. Clark coined the term difference between the hairy, ape-like hominid seen in the Midwestern and Eastern United States and more typical Bigfoot creatures from the Pacific Northwest, a primary feature is their lack of distinguishing facial characteristics, as hair often obstructs their faces. Perhaps the defining difference between Bigfoot and hairy bipeds is their number of toes, which range from two to six. Write George M. Eberhardt in Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology. All primates have five toes. Any hairy biped that leaves clear imprints showing anything less than five toes constitutes an extreme evolutionary anomaly. Pendactyl, having five fingers or toes, is common and primitive features of reptiles and mammals. However, it is no longer an essential requirement, and many animals have modified the plan. Frogs only have four digits, cows have two, horses have dropped all but one, and snakes have gotten rid of legs altogether. If three-toed, human-like bipeds really exist as flesh-and-blood creatures and are not paranormal apparitions, it would be most interesting to find out more about their foot structure. Perhaps three toes is better than five when you've chosen a swamp or wetlands as your habitat. Notice how none of the examples given are closely related to primates. Anyone who has taken a basic course in biology would understand such a departure from basic pendactyl is approximately as likely in a supposed higher primate as a reversion to egg laying, wrote Jim Brandon. Bigfoot, hairy bipeds, big monkeys, a Sasquatch by any other name would smell as awful. The subspecies hypothesis is unpalatable even among respected cryptozoologists. John Napier wrote, It is unthinkable that Sasquatch of Northwestern America, if it exists at all, should consist of two distinct families or even genera. The only alternative to uh, such a travesty of evolutionary principles is that one of the two Sasquatch footprints are man-made artifacts. Nothing about Bigfoot is proven or disproven, and it seems more parsimonious, if unacceptable, in the materialist circles to suggest we are seeing multiple manifestations of a singular wild man archetype. Rather than posting elaborate taxonomies of flesh and blood primates, surely the Rome, Ohio sighting where both pendactyl and tridactyl footprints manifested suggests as much. Indigenous lore yields a suitable precedent for tridactyl footprints. The Cheyenne Maximista is a shy and retiring creature, somewhat like the Sasquatch or Bigfoot of the Northwestern tribes, only with bird-like feet. Bird tracks, of course, typically look three-toed, with the fourth toe either not present or appearing like an elongated heel. A Kwaikutl, Bukwas variant is described as monkey-like, half-bird child with a hooked nose and head feathers, which cries like a bird or whistles. It is unclear whether these avian features extend to the being's feet. Three-toed bird tracks appear associated with wild men beyond the shores of the America. In European folklore, the Woodwose was occasionally depicted as astride a large bird, and in an illustration from Dyson Pernin's folio, other illustrations found in Tibetan Buddhism show Brahmos, attendant of Shink Young protector spirits, as monkey bodied being walking upon their bird clawed hands. Some Native American Bigfoot analogues could detach their digits, providing an if fanciful explanation for the existence of two and three toed prints in Senka myth. The Jinan Sagwa, or stone skin, possessed an animate finger that it used to locate people who are hiding. A folktale describes a weary elk hunter who craftily sneaks one Genosagwa's finger. The creature, weeping across a river, begs the hunter to return the digit. The young hunter places the finger on his palm 
and stretches his hand over the stream toward the women as far as it will go. When the Genosagua reached for it, they lost their balance and fell into the stream, sinking to the bottom. On to the next one. In Jasper, Alberta, in Canada, during October in 1955, a hairy humanoid was seen walking upright near a mine. It tipped its head back and made a sound like a half laugh, which could have almost been mistaken for language. On to the next one. In Rocky Mountain House in Alberta, Canada, in August. In the afternoon, three workmen at the Bighorn Dam site claim to have seen a humanoid figure almost three times the size of an average man. Two of the men said they saw the figure, which was about 15 feet tall, striding across a ravine. The third said he saw it watching the site from a hill. First Nations believe there is a family of four of the creature living in this area. On to the next one. In the Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada, Mr. Gerald Martin and his family watched a black Bigfoot walking up a ridge. The Martin family was walking along a ridge east of Highway 93 in the Columbia Icefield. The creature appeared too large and walking too fast to be a human. On to the next one. Guy LaRuth, 19, and Harley Peterson, 17, were building the foundations for a pump house near the river when they saw a dark figure standing on top of a 300-foot bank about a half a mile away and appearing to watch them. During the hour that they watched it, they were joined by Harley's father, Stan, 46, Mr. Floyd e. Engine, also 46, and Dale Body, 21. They were all sure the creature was quite tall and calculated after two of the men went to the place the creature had been that it must have been 15 feet tall. The size was judged by comparing it to the size of the men in the same area. They watched each other for 30 minutes. Who was watching whom and where? This was near the Bighorn Dam on the North Saskatchewan River in Alberta in Canada. On to the next one. In the area of Canicus Lake and Ribbon Creek near Banff, Alberta, Canada, three male prospectors saw a female Bigfoot that was seven to eight feet tall that was squatting near their camp at noon. The creature chattered with its teeth and moved its arms up and down. On to the next one. three people reported seeing the head and shoulders of a Bigfoot that would have been 8 to 10 feet tall standing in the bushes in the Rocky Mountain House in Alberta. On to the next one. Near the town of High Level in northern Alberta, Canada, the exact location is about 45 miles east of the town of High Level on the banks of the Peace River. What was found was hundreds of very large footprints. The toes were in many different positions in many of the tracks ruling out, as I see it, one solid mold making the print, as well as these prints were sunk into the hard river silt, where a 200-pound man had to jump to even make a mark. In addition to this, the tracks continued quite some distance and were followed by my cousin for about two miles up the river bank and into the bush. As it climbed the hill, it used its toes to dig into the hillside to get better traction. It also grabbed trees to help pull itself up, the smaller of which were torn out by the root. My cousin told me that he did not believe in Sasquatch up to this point in his life, and he really doesn't know what to think now. But one thing he does know is that whatever made these tracks was living breathing, walking on two legs, and was not a man. He has lived in northern Alberta all his life, 
and would not be so easily fooled in the bush. The story of his has been the basis of my fascination with the subject for many years now. I'm not sure who first found the tracks, but they quickly became the focal point of everyone's activities. But as far as I know, my cousin was the only one who actually followed them. This area is very isolated. There is only one road into this part of Alberta, as a quick look at a map will show. There are few farms in this area. The ground is fairly flat, save for the riverbank where this occurred. But even the riverbank that far north are not great, about 50 to 75 feet. The forest is very dense, and there's lots of it. The bush extended south for about 250 miles and goes north to the tundra, maybe 500 or 600 miles, with millions of acres anyway. The following is a collection of wild man accounts from the turn of the century which share remarkable resemblances to modern day Bigfoot sightings. Telephonic information that a lunatic or a drink crazed man is running amok at Fishhawk, a railroad construction camp a few miles southwest of here was received shortly before noon today and local police officials left immediately for the scene of the trouble. Though particulars are meager because of the apparent nervousness of the man at the other end of the wire, given to understand that a belligerent, whose name was not given, had already killed four or five horses and that men in the camp were in mortal fear of him. The camp is maintained by workmen employed on the Nihalem River Road Company Construction Enterprise in Columbia County. On to the next one. Laughing like a maniac, walking like a man, six feet tall, and as bare as Adam, Lower Crave Creek has a sensation in a wild creature that calls elusively for help, clamors over cliffs and fallen trees like an animal, and stirring up the natives to fever heat. Fire Warden Harry Shimley in company with Don Calvert and Roy Gerhardt, spent the better part of the day trying to locate what appeared to be a man calling for help, supposed an unfortunate hunter, wounded or lost. But the search was fruitless, for as each time the spot was located from where the sounds came, nothing was there. The next day, Scotty Ray, while hunting, was attracted by a strange, yellowish-looking creature scaling the cliffs across the canyon. Thinking it was a cougar, he got closer and found it fully six feet tall with beard and all the appearances of a man walking upright or on all fours at will. When it spied Scotty, this nature man let out such a continuous pearl of demonic laughter that Scotty lost his nerve and failed to shoot. On to the next one. A wild man on the Oihi Desert is terrifying the cattle and sheep, men of the territory lying along the Oregon and Nevada line. The authorities of Malheur County, Oregon, have been asked to capture him. The disturber subsists on cattle and sheep, which he kills, says the Oregon Journal. On to the next one. It is reported by parties who have recently arrived from Chambers Prairie that a crazy man has been seen in the woods near that place, and it is expected that a search will soon be instituted looking to a location of his abode. Two men who drove into Olympia from that locality a few days ago report having seen a nude man in the woods near the road acting in a very strange manner. They did not disturb him, but drove on into the city. That night, the same man was seen by a gentleman who was returning from the city and was very much frightened at the peculiar antics of the nude man. The people of that neighborhood are becoming very much alarmed at these reports, and it is probable that they will soon turn out en masse and attempt to capture the object of their affright. On to the next one. 
A wild man hath been captured on an island near Nookthak. He hath been terrorizing settlers for some time past. He wore only a breech cloth and carried an immense club. He cannot talk. A wild man, who is said to be almost entirely nude, has been discovered roaming about the mountains west of Mayfield. His appearance strikes terror into the souls of residents of that vicinity. On to the next one. A sure enough wild man was seen in the Quelute Mountains near Cape Flattery, Washington. A few days ago, and was closely and carefully scrutinized by Lawrence E. Doyle, a member of the Montana legislature who is willing to furnish affidavits with his story. He said he was traveling through an unexplored timber belt when a man of unusually large size and splendid physique, hatless and with heavy beard and stock of long hair, his arms and legs bare, and his body partially clothed in skins or fur, stepped out before him. Mr. Doyle was startled, and before he could say or do anything, the wild man, after looking at him closely, walked quietly away. Mr. Doyle watched the man with his field glasses until he was out of sight and is sure of the reality of his experience and of the wild man. Settlers in that region have claimed to have caught glimpses of a strange man, dressed in skins, and a general hunt has been planned for the purpose of capturing him. On to the next one. Deputy Sheriff Lane received a note yesterday from the Sandpoint Lighthouse Keeper stating that a wild man who has been reported as running at large in the vicinity had been seen. Mr. Lane will go out this morning to look into the matter. On to the next one. The police are trying to capture a so-called wild man who has been roaming over the western suburbs for weeks. Captain King believes the man is Adolf Metzer. King says Metzer shows a tendency to lapse into savagery and admits that for several weeks he has the police endeavoring to capture Metzer. Metzer appears to be sane but he shows a tendency to live solitarily and even animal life. He apparently forsworn anything savoring of human habitations, preferring to live in the open and foraging for a livelihood. Mertzer is accustomed himself to do without clothing, so far as the weather will permit. He runs at the approach of man. So far as known, he has never offered violence to anyone, fleeing at the approach of a child, the same upon seeing a man. Those who have caught occasional glimpses of the wild man declare that he runs with incredible swiftness for a man, and appears to be endowed with almost animal-like power detecting the approach of people. Several months ago, Mertzer was captured by the police and was kept on the chain gang for two weeks. Then he escaped, eluding persistent pursuit, and has not been seen since by the officers. He is thought to subsist on birds and small animals for which he traps and from occasionally forays on chicken hoops of suburban residents. Friends of Alfred White of Puyallup, who, while waiting for an operation at a hospital here, mysteriously disappeared three weeks ago, made a search of the West End District today in hope that the wild man might be white. They found a lair in the thick brush near Franklin School in which a man had been sleeping but could find no traces of the man. On to the next one. In Payne County in Oklahoma, my family and I arrived home after sundown and I left my car headlights on to open the door to my house. We could hear my dog barking and coming toward us when he chased what I at first thought was a man. When it came around the trees, we could see it was dark brown, covered with fur, and running toward the car, which we were still in. It then veered and ran back into the woods, still followed by our dog. 
It looked to me to be more of a youth than full grown. It was just after dusk on a clear and cold night. My home was on the back of a field surrounded by trees. There was also a creek very nearby. On to the next one. In Logan County in Oklahoma, I saw a hairy, medium-built creature about six feet tall with long arms crossing a dirt road. At first, it was walking. Then it began a fast gait after seeing me coming in my truck. I have not searched for footprints, and nothing was heard. After crossing the road, it disappeared into the woods. It was 7.15 a.m., clear and sunny, about 75 to 80 degrees. I was the only witness and was driving toward it when it started the fast gate. The sighting occurred in a heavily wooded area near a creek. A volunteer fire station was directly west, about three quarters of a mile. On to the next one. Near Chocata in Oklahoma County in Oklahoma. This is a story I have been reluctant to even think about. One night, me and three other friends were in a storage shed located on the back of my friend's property, fetching things we needed. We decided to head back to the house after we got what we came for, and I was left behind attempting to latch the door because it was very old and hard to get to fasten properly. My three buddies had walked off at this time, leaving me headed toward the house. I was walking the exact same path they were, taking actually more of a faster trot, when I heard a noise like disturbed leaf to the left of me. Curiously startled, I stopped and looked in the direction of the noise, and there it was. Now, at this location, it happens to be at the back of the house, and there is a chain-link fence and about 15 feet separating me and this creature. The thing I most remember is the size of this thing, and the silhouette of the creature head to neck and shoulders. Where a human has a visible neck, what I witnessed had not. But I did notice huge shoulder muscles, too supernatural to be anyone I've ever seen. I didn't notice how dense the hair on the body of this creature was, so it could have added to the size of what I saw. I didn't mention this, but there was only moonlight for me to see this by. Also, this thing's abdomen was also tremendous in a well-defined V-shape atop curvy big legs. I have read some of other reports and a lot noticed a pungent odor, but I did not, and I believe there was only 15 feet at the most between me and this creature. But what I did notice was a deep, deep breathing sound and a deep growl rumble like a cougar, kind of intermittent, if that makes sense. And after that, it prompted me to slowly walk off without fear. This occurrence only took about 30 to 45 seconds, but I remember what I saw. I never mentioned this to anyone until about a year later when my friend told me about something strange that happened in the woods near his property. The sighting was between 11 and 1 a.m. There was only moonlight and fair skies, at least clear enough to have decent moon visibility. It was in a grassy backyard next to a creek adjacent to a rich, thick forest. I have heard from this friend that owns the property of strange noises, of banging, loud, constant clacking of branches that come abruptly, stop, and weird screeching only at night. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!